Isn't this wonderful weather we're having? Yes. So I don't know what's up with the air conditioner, but it's not working, obviously. Um, so I'll call them out tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But who knows? We just replaced the air conditioner downstairs. There was another unit out here that's probably 30 years old. So we'll see what happens with that. All right, guys? But yeah, you know, we'll just let God do it. If we need a new one, he'll he'll take care of it. So. Well, all right, guys. Well, an exciting start to the morning. Right. Everybody okay? Yeah. You feel like you're at a tent revival? You're sweating and van? Not that old. No. Not that old. <laughs> yeah, back before electricity, we got a tent. Yeah, I got you. It's going to be a good day. We got a good message for you both today. Uh, let me let me pray so we can get up here so you ladies can sing it out. Okay. Sing it. <laughs> like, all right. Let me pray. <laughs> I'm just I'm feeling kind of weird about this. <laughs> so, Alright, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, oh, Heavenly Father, hallowed be your holy name. Your holy, holy, holy name. Father, I'm just reminded at this time of, of Isaiah and how, how his lips were burned with coal. And how at the sight of you, Father, is something that we are going to witness one day. And I am just so thankful, Father, that you have allowed us to understand your wisdom and your revelation. What a wonderful thing it is, Father, for us. A blessing for us that we know exactly who you are. Creator of all things. Creator of all things, Father. The name above all names. There are no other gods but you. And Father, we are here to praise you today. We are here to worship you. And Father, I just ask that you be with us today. As we, uh, we just bow our knees to you, Father. Father, we just want to lift up the sister's sister-in-law. That whole situation that's going on there it sounds encouraging and exciting, yet also, Father, it does sound a little uh, like, I don't know <laughs> what the word is, scary maybe, but whatever it is, Father, I hope that she belongs to you and I hope she is finding her rest and comfort in you. Hoping and knowing that she understands your will will be done here. And if it's a successful surgery and it goes all well, praise be to your holy name, Father, because it is to your glory, it is for your glory that that will be a success. Father, I just want to pray for the people in this room and the people that are not in this room that belong to this local congregation. Father, I just want to lift them up to you and, and ask that, uh, that you just continue to do what you've always done. You are the faithful one, Father. It is us who display lack of faithfulness sometimes. So, Father, I just please continue to do what you do and let us, let us understand exactly what you do. And then finally, Father, how can we not start off today giving thanks to your Son, Christ? How can we not acknowledge to you, Father, that you have been glorified by His obedience? And because He did what He said He was going to do, and He was obedient to you, Father, you have been glorified. And Father, may we, as we celebrate you today, and as we worship you today, and as we learn your word, please help us, Father, understand that we are here to glorify you as well. In your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 That's a beautiful song. Yes. Yes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. It is not hot in here, I'm telling you. No. <laughs> Stop telling me it's hot in here. <laughs> All right, I guarantee you one thing. I'm making a promise right now. If our air conditioner is not fixed next week, I will be in shorts. <laughs> All right? So make sure you get a detailed check. <laughs> All right, so. Now, I pray for me because it. If I wear shorts on Sunday morning, my wife is going to have some, something to say about me. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, before I start, though, I do want to acknowledge something about Lynn. Everybody knows Lynn, right? Oh, yeah. Everybody know who Lynn is? Lynn Coyle? All right, Lynn, I'm talking about you, girl. <laughs> so, Lynn walks in this morning, the first one in the church this morning. I can tell things are on Lynn's mind. All right. So we, she allowed me to come upstairs and sit in the office with her. She laid out a little bit of what's going on with her heart. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because, Lynn, I want you to know, and let's listen to me, I want you to know what you're doing today is very well pleasing to God. Amen. You don't want to be here. We all go through days like that, right? We're sick. We don't feel good. Whatever. We don't want to go to church. So we decide not to do it. Well, she's in that position today, but she honored God. I said, I'm coming anyway. She made herself do it. And that's a, not only a blessing to God, not only is He well pleased, 
it's probably going to work out well for you today. <laughs> is that how it works, right? Yeah, right? So I just wanted to acknowledge that, man. You keep smiling, all right, young lady? Yes. All right. Yes. So today, we're going to conclude chapter 4 <coughs> of our series in 1 Peter. Now, by now, folks, you guys do realize, I mean, it's pretty clear, right, that Peter has much to teach us about living a godly life. Yeah. Much, much to teach us. We have explored a lot of topics, haven't we, up till now? Topics such as submitting to God's will, to embracing the call to die to ourselves, just as Jesus Christ did, right? We are going to be re resurrected just as He was resurrected. You guys do realize we've also delved into the significance of suffering like Christ. We've talked a lot about suffering like Christ with the understanding that it is a blessing from God. It is a blessing from God to suffer, and it's meant to strengthen and refine us. Last week, if you remember, we discussed how our lives are supposed to be visibly different than that out there, right? Right. Absolutely. They look at us and we there to understand we are not like them. And how is it that they are going to understand that we're not like them? Well, what we do is they, what they don't do. We avoid excess. We avoid immoral behavior. That's what the world is. <coughs> Peter calls it, if you remember, an excess of debauchery. It's a scary word to me, but that's what he says. So, moving on to today, at the end of chapter 4, we're going to uncover, not one, two, but three God principles. These God principles that Peter is going to share with us are going to help us better understand how to pursue God's will. That is the point of all of this, folks. If you just step back and think about the motivation of Peter and why he's writing this letter... What you can quickly realize is simply this. Us believers are supposed to act and behave and conduct ourselves in a godly way. That's what it's about. It is not about us and God, trying to fit God into our life. Right. We are supposed to change. And this last part of section 4, whoop, it's going to give us these principles that's going to hammer it home. Those three principles are things you've already heard of. The first one is something called rejoicing. That's a God principle, to rejoice. The second one is something called judgment. We're going to talk about judgment today. God's judgment. And the third <coughs> principle we're going to talk about is something that we're going to read about called doing good. A lot of people don't like to talk about doing good. But we're going to talk about it today. So the title of this series... If you haven't seen it in your bulletin or on the screen, it's simply this. Do you guys even know that judgment has begun already for the household of God? It's already started. Do you know that? We're going to talk about that. So please, open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4 if you want to read in your Bibles. We're going to be in verses 12 through 19. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. You can absolutely read it on screen if you want. Can you guys see those? Is that too small? I do that on purpose. <laughs> Why do you think I do that on purpose? Bring your Bibles. <laughs> but you actually don't need to see it because we're going to read it out loud. I mean, I'm hopefully you can at least see it enough to follow along. But let's go to it. Let's go to God's written word. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, as follows. Beloved. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Don't be surprised, says Peter. As though something strange was happening to you. Peter says, don't be surprised by that. But rejoice, he says, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad in something else. And that something else is this, when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, talked about that in Bible study this morning, right? Persecution. If you are insulted 
for the name of Christ. Guess what, people? You are blessed. Because the Spirit of glory and God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. Evil doer. Don't even suffer as something Jerry was talking about this morning, a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For then look what Peter says next. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will do something. And what we're supposed to do is this. Entrust our soul to the faithful Creator while doing something. The two wonderful words. While doing good. Pretty powerful statement, isn't it, by Peter, when you break it down? We're going to break it down really good today. Let's see if you walk out of here thinking the same thing I think. Peter tells us something in verse 12. He tells us not to be surprised when something comes our way. What is it that's coming our way? Peter tells us. He says in verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Peter says we are going to be tested with fire. Fiery trials. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, check. That would be us, right? Yep. Then you better expect it, friends. You better expect trials and tribulations. You better expect these kind of things as a normal thing, not as abnormal. When Peter talks about fiery trials, that's just another way to say persecution. What we talked about, right? All the time. Persecution. And a very good example of godly people going through trials or persecution can be found littered throughout the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. You can read about a certain group of people being persecuted. Those people called the prophets. Y'all know who the prophets are? You know them, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know who I'm talking about here in the Old Testament. The main objective of the prophets of the Old Testament, their main objective was to receive the Word of God from God. He gives it to them. And then after receiving this Word, they were supposed to take His Word to the people. That's what the prophets' main objective was. And guess what, friends? They were absolutely hated and despised for doing this. Jesus Christ talks about this. I want to read to you what He says about this. You can read in Matthew chapter 5 as follows. Jesus speaking. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad. Where have we heard that? Rejoice and be glad for your reward is going to be great in heaven. And then He finishes the statement by saying this. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus was extremely well aware of persecution of godly people. The prophets were persecuted because those hearing the word of God, God's prophetic word, those people hearing those prophets did not like it. Does that sound like today? They did not like God's revelation being told to them by the prophets. Now, if you are a believer and you have received God's revelation, you have absolutely made it an objective of your life, right, to obey God. Isn't that what you do when you receive God's word? That's an amen, right? Well, you know what Peter is saying and Jesus is saying? You better expect to be persecuted because of it. You better not be surprised about it. You better think it's normal, not abnormal. 
Moving on to verse 13, we read, But rejoice, everyone, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. So we're supposed to rejoice in suffering, aren't we, friends? That's what it says. We've been hearing about it for weeks now. It is a wonderful privilege, friends. It is not what the world tells you it is. What suffering is, is a wonderful privilege to suffer with the Messiah. In fact, friends, we see Peter tell us not only to rejoice in suffering, rejoice in persecution, but he also tells us that because we endure with rejoicing, we're going to experience something. What does he say we're going to experience? A greater joy. He says we're going to have much, much joy at the revelation of His glory. What is he talking about here, friends? He's talking about the revealing of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. When is the glory of His return going to be revealed? It's the end times. That's when His glory will be revealed. It's called the blessed hope. We've been talking about this with Paul. We call it the rapture. So think about this, friends. Just ask yourself this question. How much joy do you think you're going to have when Jesus Christ returns? You can't explain it, can you? Tell me the words you're going to use. There are no words to explain it. Peter tries. He says, you're going to be glad. That don't, that don't describe it, does it? It's hard to imagine the words that we're going to be, or the feelings that we're going to have when Jesus Christ returns. But I guarantee you, we will not be joyed. We will be overjoyed. We'll be over something. It is more joy than we can possibly imagine. That's what Peter is talking about. And in verse 14, we see a very interesting word picture used by Peter. Perhaps you have not heard this, what I'm about to say. Maybe you have heard this. But it's a very truthful and interesting word picture of what Peter is doing here. He says in verse 14, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the Spirit of the glory, the Spirit, I'm sorry, the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So in, I'm using the ESV version here. Because it uses the word insult. You see the word insult up there? We're told in Scripture we're going to be insulted for the name of Christ. Now whatever you think that means, here's what Peter actually intends for us. The actual Greek word for insult is a word that I can't even pronounce. I didn't even put it up on the screen. It's so long and annoying I can't now. I just can't do it. But it is a descriptive word and it describes something in vivid detail. And what it describes is three words. To show teeth. Peter is telling us if you are involved with something showing teeth, pay attention. Now let me give you the intent of what Peter's talking about here. Have you ever approached a dog or any animal and that dog is weary of you? And what does he do? He shows his teeth, doesn't he? He starts growling, showing his teeth. He is letting you know that something is going on he don't like. He is letting you know you are intruding on his turf while you're trying to go up there and pet him, right? This is the image that Peter is trying to give us about what he's talking about. So let's tie it together. The world, the world, shows its teeth to you. It doesn't like what you're doing as a believer in Jesus Christ. They show their teeth. They're going to pounce on you. They're going to attack you because you belong to the Christ. You get the word picture of what Peter's doing here? And when the world is showing its teeth at you because you are walking in faithfulness to God, because you are walking in obedience to God, Peter says, you are blessed. That means, friends, to be blessed, 
you got to be doing something right, don't you? That's exactly what it means. Isn't this, think about this, isn't this statement by Peter so true in America and the world today? When the world sees a believer walk in faithfulness, it gets offended, doesn't it? You want a good example of America showing its teeth to a believer? Well, let me, let me lay it on you. Look at our United States of America government. Think about our government. Our government, who says they're for you, actually shows their teeth all the time to believers. All the time the government is showing its teeth. It is saying to believers and those who follow the Christ, you can't do that. You can't, Mr. and Mrs. Believer, display Christian symbols on public property. You can't, Mr. and Mrs. Believer, put a cross on the courthouse. You can't, Mr. and Mrs. Believer, sponsor or endorse prayer in public schools. Oh yeah, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Believer, you can't stop us, the government, from murdering babies in the wombs either. The U.S. government has no problem whatsoever showing its teeth to the believers of Jesus Christ. No problem whatsoever. There is so much immorality in America and in the world today, friends. And what's really sad is America and the world are absolutely at peace with that immorality. No question about it. But we don't have any worries, friends. We are different, right? Yes. We are blessed. Yes. Because we have what Peter says we have. We have the glory, the spirit of glory, and we have God resting on us. That's why we don't have any worries, friends. Now this term resting on us simply means anointing. It's simply what it means. And who in the world in this room doesn't want to be anointed by God? Is there anybody in this room who doesn't want His anointing? Nope. Nobody raised their hand on that one. We all want His anointing. Don't we all crave God's anointing? Well, Peter is telling you how to get it, isn't he? What does he say how to get it? He says you get it when you endure insulting. When you endure someone showing their teeth at you because you are suffering in the name of Jesus Christ. You get His anointing when you start living God's way. Not. That. That's what Peter's telling us. Now Peter spends a lot of time in this letter telling us believers what to do, doesn't he? You better be doing this. You better be doing that. Suffering, blah, blah, blah. Well, here in verse 15... We see some things Peter tells us not to do. Let me read it to you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. It's pretty simple to understand these in this verse, right? This isn't anything out of the ordinary for us. Don't be murdered, people. Don't do it. Don't be stealing things. But here's an interesting statement. Don't be a meddler. What are you talking about, Peter? Don't be a meddler. What are you talking about? Well, this Greek word for meddler, the original Greek text, it's another word that I can't pronounce. <laughs> so I'm not putting it up there, all right? <laughs> but it does have a basic meaning like this. It means, don't be a person who thinks that you have to get involved in everybody's business. In other words, don't be a person who thinks you always have to insert yourself into other people's affairs. It's an interesting statement, isn't it, friends? Isn't that what we talked about this morning, kind of? In Bible study? Just a little bit. This statement by Peter seems to be akin to a very popular statement that you hear a lot of believers spew out of their mouth at times. You know what statement I'm talking about when I say this? You better pay attention to your own house, people, instead of other people's houses. This is what he's talking about, right? It's best to leave it right there and let you take it home with you. Verse 16 is just Peter reiterating 
that God is glorified when a believer suffers. And the believer deals with that suffering in the way that God says they're supposed to deal with it. It says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that way. Start doing what God says. Understanding what suffering is and dealing with it the way God says, and he <coughs> will be glorified. <coughs> and in the next verse, verse 17, this is a verse we need to spend a little bit of time with today. Let me read it to you. It says, let me get a drink, I'm sorry. I must be talking too much. Okay, all right. It says in verse 17, For it is time, friends, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. That's a statement, isn't it? It is time, friends, for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what's going to be the outcome for those who do not Obey the gospel of God. Who is the household of God, people? It's you, Joe. Judy, Vicky, Dad, Jerry. It's us, right? Are we not the household of God? It's everyone in this room who professes and believes in Jesus Christ and has repented. And Peter makes it absolutely clear, friend, that believers are going to be judged. Makes it absolutely clear. In fact, he says that judgment for believers, judgment for Joe, Thad, Linda, Brian, Judy, Lynn, has already begun. It's already begun, friends. It's already begun. Do you believe that? That's what it says, right? Do you believe that? I know a lot of people I talk to outside of these walls who claim to be believers who don't believe that. Does that mean, friends, is what Peter telling us is that God is judging us right now while we are here on earth? Is that what that means? You better believe that's what it means. That's exactly what it means. Exactly what it means. You and I are being judged by God at this very moment. We have been since the moment we became a believer in the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. What Peter is really talking about is how believers are what? Judged first, and then something else happens. The non-believers, they get judged. That's why he says, the judgment for the house of God has begun now. So why is God judging believers first, friends? Can you answer that question? When Peter has talked just two chapters ago about how you are supposed to be ready to defend your faith, explain it to the people. Why is God judging believers first? Well, the reason He's doing it, friends, is because this judgment is for the purpose of refining. It is for the purpose of sifting, like sifting wheat. The judgment by God that is happening right now for believers is for the purpose of making a change of us. And it's a painful judgment, isn't it? Because hasn't Peter just spent many, many words and sentences in this letter speaking about suffering? Suffering is hard, isn't it? It's painful, isn't it? Because God is changing us. He is molding us. He is sanctifying us. He is edifying us. And He uses judgment to do that. And the reason He uses judgment to do that is so that we will get on our knees and glorify Him. That's exactly why He's doing it, friends. It is all about glorifying Him. We want this kind of judgment in our lives, people. We want this kind of judgment. This kind of judgment is what God has deemed necessary for us to draw closer to Him. And that's what we say we want, right? We talk it all the time. We want to get intimate with God. This is how we do it. What we don't want, though, friends, is the judgment Peter mentions at the end of the verse, where he says this, 
What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? What's the gospel of God? You all know what the gospel of God is, right? You know what the will of God is. It is to accept His Son, Jesus Christ, as the Savior, the Redeemer, the plan of redemption. God says if you're a person who doesn't believe that or accept that, you're getting judgment. You're getting judgment, He says. You're getting judgment. But you're going to get a different kind of judgment, aren't you? Those who disobey the gospel, they're not being judged first. We believers are. The non-believers, it hasn't started for them yet. Can you really simply grasp the magnitude of exactly what Peter is saying here, friends? I mean, for me, it makes me step back. Step back. Just so in the whole big picture of what God is offering. Peter is talking about how us believers are so, so blessed. We are so blessed. We are so blessed because God has showed us favor. And He gives us wisdom and revelation to learn and live His way, doesn't He? We have understanding. That we believe God at what He says. But non-believers, there is no hope for them. None. They do not suffer for God. For God. They don't suffer for God because they don't believe what God says. They don't believe it. They are in a terrible, terrible, desperate situation, friends. Not only are they separated from God right now, there is a time coming when they will be separated forever. They're in a terrible situation. The takeaway, friends, is God judges all people. There is no one who is exempt from God's judgment. No one. Praise God that we believers, the household of God, we get a judgment that is very different from those who do not obey the Word of God. Verse 18 really contrasts the difference of this judgment between believers and those who disobey God. It says, And if the righteous is scarcely saved, that would be us, right? If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? <laughs> the righteous being scarcely saved? Us, the household of God, what does that mean? It simply means this, and it makes sense. The righteous will have difficulty in life. They will be going through suffering. Because that's what we do for God. But it's different from those other people who are ungodly. It is different for those people who are sinners and not saved. The ungodly is going to experience suffering as well, no doubt about it. Both groups will experience suffering. But there's a difference. Suffering for the righteous? We're blessed, aren't we? That's what it says. We're blessed. How blessed are we to be going through the suffering? Because that suffering is going to change us. It's going to draw us closer to God. But suffering for the ungodly? That is simply a call to repentance. It is a call to repentance. Because if you do not repent, guess what happens? You will experience the suffering of God's wrath. That's what you will get. It's different than us. Now our last verse today is verse 19. Let me read it to you. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to the faithful Creator while doing something. While doing what, friends? Doing good, right? What in the world is Peter talking about here? I mean, we should always pay attention, shouldn't we, when God speaks of Himself in, in the Word? When God speaks of Himself in this Word, we should pay attention. So why is God speaking about Himself as a faithful Creator? Now usually, I don't know what you think, but usually when creation is spoken of, we think of things in the past, don't we? Don't we often go back to Genesis 1 in the beginning? That's creation, right? But here in 1 Peter, God is revealing something different to us than in the beginning. Not talking about 
faithful creator as in the beginning. Peter is talking about something else we believers already know about our creator. You just might not think about it too much. And here's what we know. That the world does not. The creator, the faithful creator, is not done. He is not done with his glorious work of creation. Not even close. When you study those old prophets that we mentioned earlier, when you study those prophets with intention, you will notice that they speak of things like this. God stretching out the heavens. God putting things in order. The prophets speak about how a new kingdom reality is coming. Those of us who believe, and that's me, do you all believe there's a new kingdom coming? Yes. I do. We understand that suffering according to the will of God is extremely important and very necessary in our relationship with Him. Peter talks about entrusting our soul to this Creator. The logical question is simply this, friends. Do you entrust your soul to the faithful Creator? Do you? Do you entrust your soul to the faithful Creator? Everyone in here is doing this, right? Praise the Lord for that. Well, look how Peter ends this section, friends, where he talks about us believers who trust our soul to God. Look what he says. Because that's us, right? He says, we believers are supposed to be doing good. We're supposed to be doing good. Do you know what doing good means? Good works. Doing good means good works. Now, before you start throwing something at me, I say this all the time, and I'm saying it again. Do not hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We are not talking about salvation. Good works. Doing things for God does not save you. The blood of Jesus Christ saves you. Amen? Amen? But that doesn't mean good works are not extremely important to God. That doesn't mean you are supposed to stop doing good. That's why Peter's saying, do good. People who are committed to God, people who are believers in Messiah, are people who are committed to good works. Because God expects good works from us. He's expecting it from us. This is related to the judgment that Peter mentions earlier that has begun for the household of God. You remember what I just said a few sentences ago? The judgment for the household of God has already begun. It's related to this right here. Doing good. Crickets. This judgment that Peter is talking about for the household of God is this, friends. God is judging how we live our life today. He's judging. That's why it's already begun. Do you know that Christ talks about this extensively? I'm not making this up. Jesus Christ talks about it. Let me read it to you. Several of them. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says in Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, says Jesus Christ, let your light shine before others so that they may see something. What does Jesus Christ want the world to see about you? Your good works. And how it gives glory to the faithful creator of all things. In Luke, oh, we're not done. In Luke chapter 10, verses 36 through 37, check out what Jesus says. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one showing him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do the same thing. Do you think showing mercy is good works? You better believe it is. 
That's good works. We're not done yet. Look at Matthew 25 where Jesus says this. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Jesus Christ answers them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of them, you're doing it to me. That's good works, isn't it, friends? Doing what is good, doing what is good, good works, is when a believer understands that God has expectations on how we live our life today. He has expectations. Peter talks about how the judgment has begun. And God is judging our conduct, friends. Is that an ouch? An ouch for me. He is judging us on how we have incorporated His way into our living. He is judging on how we exactly took this and applied it here. He is not judging our conduct for salvation. We believers in Christ are in the kingdom. We are saved. Because we have repented and put our faith in the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? That is who Daniel prophesied about in chapter 7. Where, and that man is Jesus Christ coming on the clouds. That's how we are saved. We are told also by Jesus in the book of Revelation that He is judging His church. We've gone over this in the past, but let me remind you of what He says. Because He, the Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, is paying attention to His church, His Ecclesia. He is paying attention to how we conduct ourselves on earth. Let me just read the one example I'm going to give you today in Revelation 2. Jesus taught me. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze, says this to you and me. I know your deeds. I know exactly what you're doing, Maddox. I know it. And I know what you're doing, Zadie, and I know you and you and you. That's what he says. I know your works. Your love and faith and service and patience and endurance. And that your latter works exceed the first. Jesus Christ is paying attention, isn't he? Do you think this is what Peter's talking about when he says the judgment has begun? You better believe that's what he's talking about. There is no doubt, friends, what I am telling you is scriptural. There is also no doubt many people out in the world will tell you something different. They will tell you something different about good works, won't they? But if we read the Bible as God intends it for us, then we learn truth. Good works are supposed to be a part of the believer's life. They're supposed to be. Peter just says it while doing good. But we just got to understand, friends, something that the world doesn't understand. And we do understand it, right? Good works is not related to salvation. It's not. It can't be. If good works was related to salvation, then the work of Christ would have just been something normal. And it's what Jesus Christ did was not normal. Good works simply means, friends, we are to take this, learn it, and start doing it his way, not our way. That's what it means. So we should leave here today asking ourselves, shouldn't we? Are we doing good works? Are we doing good? That Peter talks about in verse 19. Because his whole letter is about what? How to live a life that pleases the faithful Creator. That's what the whole letter is about. Maybe we should leave here asking ourselves this. Do we know that suffering for the will of God is a blessing and that we shouldn't run from it? Should we leave with that one too? Well, whatever it is you're going to leave with today, whatever God has laid in front of you, I pray that you, and I pray that I, understand that revelation that He's given us and that we do something with it. We don't stuff it in the corner and walk out the doors and go do what we normally do. 
Because that's what we like to do, isn't it? That's what we like to do. Now next week we start the last chapter of Peter, First Peter. And in this last chapter we're going to see a change by who Peter is talking to. Up until now, Peter has been talking primarily to Jewish believers in the diaspora. To believer, Jewish believers in Christ, which includes us. Up until now, while speaking to those people that included everything, we have to understand, we walk out the doors with that teaching for us because we belong to the family of God. But he switches the next chapter to a group of people called leaders in the church. Who is a leader in the church? <laughs> He's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I get it, right? He's switching to talk to leadership. And if Peter was standing here today, friends, in the world, in America, in Chinook, maybe even in this church, if he was standing here today, how likely do you think Peter would not be happy with the leadership of the church today? Knowing what you know, what he's teaching us, do you think Peter would be happy or unhappy with the church leadership of today? Well, in my world where I spend a lot of time researching other preachers and talking to other preachers and other teachers of God's Word, I have discovered, probably like you, I, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I have discovered that there are many leaders in the church who are self-centered and who are focused on that. Peter would not be happy. Can't imagine what Jesus Christ is thinking. We need to hear what Peter has to say next week. We need to hear this about for the leadership. In fact, we all need to hear everything Peter is saying here. Because what Peter is talking about is changing your life. Changing your life to be a follower of him learning God's ways. Which means you've got to give it up. It's hard to do, isn't it? It's very hard to do. And the reason why it's so important, friends, because you all and I know, you all know the opportunity for change is running out. It's running out. We're getting closer and closer. We are quickly approaching the end times. We've talked about prophetic signs happening. You saw the, the Bible study Wednesday night just as one. And because we are approaching the end, because we're getting closer, friends, we need to remember something very important. How sad is it? How shameful is it that Satan understands something most people don't understand? Satan knows the time is short, so he is working hard, isn't he? Yeah. Satan knows he has very little time left. And since he knows he's already been defeated, because he knows that already, he is working in overtime mode. He is doing everything he possibly can to get as many people as he possibly can to join him in Hades. That's why we're going to hell in a handbasket, isn't it? Because Satan knows exactly what's going on here, friends. The problem is, many believers, including all those non-believers out in the world, don't know it. They don't live their life like that. How they live their life? As they always have. Never changing. And my hope is that we believers in this local congregation, we who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, I pray that as we walk out these doors today, we are committed to doing good, to doing what is right. It is not controversial, friends, to abound in good works. That's the expectation. That's biblical. Peter has spent an entire letter explaining that our conduct matters. That our conduct is going to have eternal consequences. I just read what Jesus said. Not only will it be consequences for you, but also for people you come in contact with. God is expecting things from us. As believers, we are called to manifest His righteousness through our conduct so His glory will be revealed to the world. That's why. My question for you and me, will we respond accordingly? That being said, let's sing it out, Ms. Jean.